sure everybody can see everybody. Definitely went to one of those um, local tourist trap shops to get this. Uh, can't actually see whether everybody's in the shop. Do you like live stream to the same? Where do you uh, to our YouTube page, yeah. I'm. I would really love it if um, somebody created a live streaming platform that um, streams to m multiple things, but like the things that people are on today, like like TikTok or you know all of that sort of stuff. Um, there used to be like Streamyard. Right. The Streamyard can only get you to you know, a handful of places now. Yeah, yeah. And I kind of want to bring everything at once, but also like Twitter's, like, let's make this into a Twitter space. Or... Right. Well, you know what would be great is if it was also like an AI editing backend, so it would like take the clips and then edit it to be right sized. Somebody just pitched content. me on that manual. Yeah, that's actually pretty doable. Um, you could start manually and then. Right. But the thing is, if you want it to be fast, you actually can, right? Yeah. <coughs> if it's real time. Right. You'd have to figure out what's interesting, too. Right, but yeah, I think that's actually like, possible. I've seen quite a bit of like automated editing stuff. That's yeah. a great use case for it. It doesn't need to be perfect. It just needs to be like good enough. Yeah. Yeah. Or even just like, here's what we think 20 good clips are. Totally. Pick out, oh yeah, these 10 are fine. Totally. And then eventually yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Right, so uh, I'm <laughs> Cool. All right, we're going to we've, we've actually just decided to cancel this panel. We're going to start a company yeah. on our own. And we've come up with a few ideas here. This is very, so, very dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, actually, the history of VCs saying, wouldn't this be a good idea, and then starting it is like probably not a great history of um, startups, but um, that doesn't stop us from doing uh, side project stuff. So, um, we're going to jump right in. And uh, for those of you who uh, haven't been before, uh, my name is Charlie O'Donnell. I'm uh, the sole partner at Brooklyn Bridge Ventures. And um, Brooklyn Bridge focuses on pre-seed and seed, mostly uh, lead or co-lead, although if another VC wants to do the work, I'm happy to take a back seat as well, um, across a wide variety of areas. Um, but uh, mostly focused on New York City companies. Uh, I always like to say that the criteria is, um, can I bike to the company? And uh, yes, I can bike to Jersey. Um, it does involve a ferry or a train. Um, we could go the George Washington Bridge route, but that's just a very round roundabout way. Um, however, it is really hard to bike to Newark because the <laughs> paths that, that Google Maps will put you on have definitely never had a cyclist on them before. And sometimes they involve crossing a highway, so I like would not recommend cycling to Jersey City. Yeah, Jersey City <laughs> Keep is it much, easy. much better. Much better. Um, I'm gonna let my panelists introduce themselves, and I'll just say, um, given that we have the, uh, the space open, make sure you project to the back. Um, and uh, yeah, like strict posture, projection, all of that sort of stuff. So, uh, Alice, yeah. So hi everybody. Um, I'm Alice. I'm the founder of a company called Recollect. Uh, we're building an AI-powered thought partner, um, and I am uh, I've raised some funding and some funding from Charlie. Cool. Awesome. Hey everybody, my name is Brandon Mitchell, founder and CEO of RightSea.com. We are a freelance management platform for small to medium sized businesses as well as job boards. Um, and so we recently closed our round in December and we're just happy to be here and happy to give some good information. And Kate was a little bit of a last minute invite. Uh, Kate actually is on the VC side. Uh, Cameron from WeStock is going to join our next one. He is actually a new dad, and so he has a perfectly legit excuse for uh, not being able to, to make it. But I thought it would be great to have another VC perspective. So Kate, why don't you tell us about your very, shopping firm? Very happy to be here. So I'm Kate McAndrew. I'm actually based in San Francisco, just in New York for the week. Um, I'm the co-founder and general partner of a firm called Baukunst. There's four GPs, two on the East Coast, two in San Francisco. Um, it's a $100 million fund one that we just announced in September, and we exclusively lead pre-seed rounds. And sometimes that means co-lead and what have you. And I've been doing kind of first check venture for about 10 years. So really, you know, being the first investor, leading that round, and then helping folks often through this 
the seed financing process, through closing out the pre-seed, getting the seed done, getting the Series A done, and so um, I've seen a lot of early stage rounds, good, bad, and ugly, and you know, very happy to talk with you all about my perspective on that. And specific industries, areas? So we're pretty generalist. Um, uh, we kind of talk about the frontiers of technology and design as being our centralizing principle. Um, but we're, we're a little bit known for doing things that other folks won't do. So we do software, but we will also do hardware software, we'll do direct-to-consumer, so quite, quite generalist. And um, you often will see us doing things that have like a little bit of a deep tech flavor, uh, but both enterprise and consumer. I personally do mostly consumer investing, but the fund is about 50-50. Cool. So we're going to go uh, in a little bit of chronological order here. And so, um, Allison, I'm going to start with you. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about the original sort of moment where the idea came to you and, and whether or not that was immediate, that it should be a company and that it might need funding? So how did you, because I'm sure you probably have come up with lots of ideas over time, but at some point, this is the one that bubbled to the top and you thought it was worth pursuing. So how did you filter that? Yeah, I, for me it was actually a two-step process. Um, while I was already employed, I was thinking about what my next move would be. I was thinking of ideas. Um, I've been in the machine learning space for a really long time, so I was looking at what I thought was going to come next. Um, and so my actually original idea uh, was a bit farther out than what we ended up building. Um, it involved hardware, it was more in the sort of deeper tech space. Um, and so I got enough conviction while I was still in my job to say, okay, I've got some runway, I like this idea, I'm gonna go and start working on it. And then, um, sort of naively, I assumed, like, great, I'll find a co-founder along the way if it has legs, and then I'll go and raise funding, whatever that means. Um, and so I did that, I uh, started working on the initial idea. I actually looked into non-dilutive funding first. Um, so NSF has these great grants you can do. Um, started the application process of that, and then the pandemic happened. Um, and for me as a first time founder, uh, I kind of hit the place where I thought, oh, I think this is real. I'm really excited about it. And now it sounds like funding's going to be really hard. So um, I took a few months, sort of joined a bunch of these like on deck and things like that to go help find a co-founder, figure this stuff out. I did a ton of learning about uh, investing during that period. So I read everything I could. I talked to people. I talked to other founders. Um, and I continued to work on the idea without the hardware component to it at all and thought, okay, let me try to scope this down. Um, so the swing went by two phases. I had the one where I got conviction enough to leave my job and work on this and felt like worst case scenario, I would go get another job. Um, then I fell in love with it and didn't want to go get another job and then spent the time to kind of rework it. Once I got conviction on the sort of no hardware piece, then I really set out to go and start to raise those funds. But I had the time to get smart on how this process works, what do I even do? Um, and so at the beginning of that. I, I have a question yeah. about that, yeah. that actually. So you, you went around and joined a bunch of stuff and probably heard lots of different, maybe conflicting things about taking on investment, having a co founder. Um, in, in those really early learnings, what was the thing that you found most informative about this early process? And what was the thing that you heard often that turned out to be completely wrong? Um, one of the things that was most informative for me was around the, like, how do you run a process? Like, how long should this take? You should have some structure around it, get your intros together, put these lists together, and then systematically kind of do that. It wasn't about, oh, I'll start having some lunch with people and see how it goes. Um, so that was very helpful. Um, the non-helpful bits, I think, there's a lot of uh, different differing opinions on you know, when should you raise capital? Uh, what should your terms be? Like, a lot of people are like, never raise any capital from venture capitalists. So like, do everything you can, bootstraps. Yeah, they're all awful. Uh, you're like, you know, you, now you're on like a, an accelerator, you can't get off, you're gonna like give yourself a heart attack. Um, so there's so much noise in that space and the advice, I feel like that was really unhelpful because it can cause this like, and then other people are like, raise as much as you can, just go out and like pitch whatever. Like people are throwing money at this, like in this space and you can feel like, oh, I should like just spin this into that then if that's where all the money is like dumping into this ground of it, that, that point it was Web3. I was like, I don't really do Web3 though. Um, so yeah, very conflicting advice. I think it was not helpful in that space to like get lots of people's opinions at all. Kate, why are VCs awful? 
people who do it for like the spiritual fulfillment right like some people are, are really in it for the money and that um, I think that can create some misaligned incentives like I really like to work with founders who are deeply passionate about the problem they're trying to solve there are problems in the world that I'm deeply passionate about trying to solve I believe that if we solve those problems in a meaningful way, we all make money, right? Well, we're gonna create value and, and money is a is a marker of value. And so that's how I do the work. I think there are a lot of people who feel similarly. Um, and there's a lot of people who who don't, right? And so I think it's about just finding your your people. Um, and so I, I think that that is a big part of it. It's, yeah. The, the one other thing that I'll add to you is, I, I do think there's a, um, there's, what your company represents to you is very different than what this investment represents to me. And it's not to say that um, that I don't care about my portfolio companies and that this isn't important, but like we have a portfolio, mm -hmm. right? And at the end of the day, my attention is gonna be divided across like 30 portfolio companies. And you know, I know the reality that roughly 10% of the companies that I back are gonna drive most of the returns. And probably half of them are not gonna make it at all. And so when there are instances where it doesn't look like the company's gonna make it, or on the flip side, when something is working, um, I need it to work really well to make to make up for the ones that, that don't make it, right? So I have an incentive to to push a little bit, right? And and my uh, investment is, is risk taking capital, right? Whereas uh, it may be difficult for the founder to do things that add risk because you're like, oh, I don't want to mess this up. This, this is working okay, right? And I don't want this to become a zero. The harsh reality is I can afford the zero if it means that it increases my chance that it might return my fund. And that's just not the same calculation that it is for uh, an individual founder. Um, tell us a little bit about your origin story and the, the kernel of the idea and when you decided like, this is the thing out of all my ideas. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, because for me, Rightsy, I think it's business number about seven or eight. I started okay. my entrepreneurship journey when I was a freshman in college. I'm trying to do platforms and figure things out. Um, and then I went to go work at PwC right out of college um, on 42nd Madison. So then I spent some time as a tech consultant and trying to figure things out and um, tinker and play. Um, and then I quit my full-time job and started a business called Brand Resumes back in 2019. And it was like a resume writing business where we were helping job seekers uh, essentially get to their dream job as fast as they could. Um, and that business worked out really, really well. So it's, it's interesting that I always tell people that I'm not a first-time founder, I'm a first-time tech founder because in the service-based business area, it's a little bit different, it's a little bit simpler. You're selling a singular product and it's customers in your market, and you're doing your thing, and then you're, you can be successful based off of if you're selling your product, you're making revenue, you can pay your bills, right? Which is typically not many margins, but it's there. And so when I was growing that business, um, I realized that we were scaling, it was going really, really well, but the internal operations weren't working out as, as really, uh, as good as I wanted it to. There was a lot of things where everything was manual when you're running a service-based business, you're using Google Forms for this and like job form for that. And so I realized that, hey, if we wanted to scale this business, we, we needed to system, systematize things, automate, make things better. Um, and that was an aha moment that I was like, well, we're, we're doing this, it's working, and then we, we, we want to make this better, but what is out there so that I can grow? And then I realized I'm doing a ton of research, which is what every entrepreneur should do. You know, dive into your competitors and see if there's a tool out there. And I realized that, Nothing exists for what I was trying to solve, which was to better streamline, manage, and operate the type of business that I was running, which was a writing and coaching based business. Um, and so when I figured that out, I was like, well, my background is in product management, a tech consultant, um, I can speak technical, I'm not a developer, but I can you know, uh, speak the language, I was managing developers when I was at PwC at one point. Um, and I said, well, I'm going to build this thing. And so 
Um, I took my own money that I was making profits from service-based business, which people thought I was crazy because you could, you know, take your money and like, go on vacation for running a service-based business. But I said, you know what? I'm going to invest in myself. I'm going to invest in this thing for just brand resumes. And we kind of built an MVP. And then I quickly realized that, wait, um, this is really good for myself. How many other businesses around the world would actually benefit from this thing that we created? Um, and so I really just bet on myself. And then so we took the MVP. We spent a lot of time developing it into like a, a, a white a white little platform where we can sell to others. And then it was insane. Uh, once we launched it, uh, after about six, seven months of development, we had a client the first day who paid like three thousand eight hundred dollars for like an annual subscription day one. And so at that moment, I said, well. Okay, I knew it was for me, and then I didn't know that other folks would want to buy this as well, but it was successful from the, the first day, and I said, okay, this is the thing, maybe we should raise venture eventually for this, and then um, that whole journey of trying to figure out venture was pretty scary, because I um, see all these statistics around, like, the founders of color don't ever get investment, and, um, you know, like, certain types of businesses are, uh, and, 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 and industries don't, uh, are not the same, right? So there's, like, FinTech and all these HR techs, and so even trying to figure out, like, what you know, a specific category my this idea was in was really hard. So it was a journey. Um, I knew it was something that was gonna, going to be successful for me because I validated it already, but um, just trying to like navigate the, this ocean of just information and, you know, these mentorship programs and stuff, but at a certain point, uh, before we raise it and all that stuff like that, I said, well, I don't know what I'm doing. I need to find like insights. So then I started to look into like accelerator programs and do two of those, which was really, really, really helpful. So shout out to uh, Expert Dojo and Visible Hands. Um, and just like, you know, looking for community, like that was a hard part too. So I felt like there's a lot more times where I was just like, I don't know what's going on and this is just feeling really hard and overwhelming. But um, I knew that it was going to be successful and I thought if I just stuck to my gut and built this thing that worked for me, eventually it would really pick up. Let me ask you a question about, so you knew from very early on that somebody wanted to buy this and you experienced the problem yourself, so you were sort of coming out from a customer's perspective. But you said like, I knew this would be successful, and sometimes I find that like when I get a pitch, it's very clear that what is being shown to me is a business. Uh, not as clear to me that it is like a venture-sized business. So, did you go through any kind of exercise or modeling or mar market sizing or even just in terms of maybe pushback from the first couple of VCs that you talked to where you had to sort of bridge the gap between I know this is a business because look someone's paying me for it and like this is a venture scale business where this type of financing is appropriate for this company yeah absolutely um, you know so the the product ended up being originally a SaaS platform for businesses like myself. So the business originally brand resumes, service-based business, we're selling services for four, five, six hundred dollars. Uh, we would sell you know, a career advancement package, they would buy it, super simple business. But the SaaS model was, hey, we built this platform to better manage, scale your operations. You're going to pay us $99 a month, $100 a month, um, $400 a month if you're a small team. Um, and so once we were able to kind of articulate that model that, hey, like, this is a SaaS business model, we have people signing up for annual subscriptions, um, we can model out this revenue over, hey, if we get a thousand writers or coaches in the first year, like, what does that AR look like, right? Like, what is the monthly current revenue? And so that wasn't the hardest thing uh, for us in terms of the poor pure business model, where we got a lot of pushback was on the market size initially, right? Like, is this market big enough initially for writers and coaches? I know that you're successful, like, you know this space, but how big is this really? In? And so it was a lot of push and pull between, hey, um, I know this space globally, there, there, might, there may not be a lot of research out there, um, but you know, I, there's, there's, you know, when you, when you have a demo and you start demoing your product and just the willingness and the urgency of people say, oh my God, this is amazing, like I need this now. Um, and then you start doing further research, you can kind of put some numbers behind it, but a lot of it was market size pushback originally. It wasn't um, that the business didn't make sense, they, they loved the platform. It was just, well, how big can this thing be? And those conversations were, were really tough. Um, and it was a lot of like, I this world, for example, like trying to you know, show market research and, and articles, especially if the space that you're going into isn't very um, 
research, and, and there's not a lot of industry news out there, it can be a little, bit, a little bit hard to kind of tell that story. But once we landed our lead investor, which happened three months after we started fundraising, it became a little bit clearer that to other VCs that, hey, um, someone did the deeper research. Because I feel like when you first start out, when you're having these VC conversations, they're like, they kind of believe you kind of don't, right? Like, um, but not every VC is going to really dive deep into what you're giving them. And so the one that did was like, oh my God, you're onto something here. And then it became a little bit easier. Gotcha. So, Kate, let me ask you about market sizing, mm -hmm. okay? Because a lot of times we're investing in things that are new or some technology change has made something uh, easier to do for a large number of people. So how do you kind of get over the hump of areas where like, it's not big today, but you're expecting it to be bigger in the future. What are some of the ways that entrepreneurs have made a, a market size case to you? And, and how important is market size to you? I think market size or market potential is critical, right? Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, pre-iPhone, there wasn't an existing market for iPhones, but there was a demographic set that would be interested in this that had, you know, that had cell phones that perhaps were also, there was a user number of how many people were using MapQuest, or, you know, like, there's a way to kind of come at the problem of my product creates an experience that is gonna resonate with this segment of the market. And if you do the bottoms up math on adoption within that market, then you can start to see, okay, what happens if it works, right? And I think in our seat, it's very easy to just give a no and say market's too small. I think what's difficult and part of what's exciting about being very early is you get to do the dreaming and say, but what if it works, right? And our job is to sort of believe in the, what if it works. Um, so I think that there are, like I've done a couple, I'm a, the, I led the pre-seed in a company called Bobby Baby, which is a direct-to-consumer infant formula company, organic, like high price point, crazy revenue ramp, I mean, going gangbusters. And market size was a real discussion uh, because there's only 4 million babies born every year. That's not changing. Right? Organic formula is a I've small... I've got one. Four million seems like a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, an organic formula is a small part of the overall formula market. And so it was very interesting. Like, this co company is, is really actually changing the dynamics of that market. And they had business model innovation to bring to that market. So it's also, it's not just about how big is the market. It's also what's the business model and how does that impact, you know, the P&L and, you know, the enterprise value that you can create within a given category. So um, so it's important, but I think it's, it's uh, there's storytelling that you can do, and it should be real, because you have to convince yourself that it, yeah. you, know, you that this is you know a worthy ride, and that this is the right kind of capital for you. And so I think just be honest in your communication of that with folks. Yeah, and, and to that point, you know, uh, post fundraise and stuff like that, it, it's made me realize that I, I fundamentally believe that founder market fit is a little bit more important than product market fit because I think that you should be a domain expert in the field that you're working in which, right? Um, because if you're trying to innovate as well as research at the same time and, and execute, like that's a lot, right? Uh, which can take away from actually building the thing and figuring it out and, and, and making the sales and doing the whole thing. And so um, what we've realized is that um, our product has changed, right? Like it started off as like this freelance management platform for writers and coaches, then eventually all freelancers, but then we realized that there was a, a, a use case that was super out of the scope, but could you know bring in 90% of our revenue. We'd sort of look at forecasts and things like that. And uh, we experimented with that use case, which then helped us land a, our code. And so you, sometimes I feel like we get tied to just like, like be narrow focus, like course blinders on like what we're doing, um, but it's important to kind of look at like, do I know this industry? Like, can I speak in the, can I operate in this space? And um, this is something that I, I truly, um, you know, I'm, I'm a master. And, and that's where you can kind of get that, like, what is your advantage over others, right? Like, is it like this just atrocious advantage because you just know it so well, where you're just, um, you're able to just cut through the noise. So that's something that I've I realized. So I, I want to um, ask you about uh, the process you talked about, but I'll make a quick market size comment. I, I actually, I reached out to uh, Nabil from Spark because we were having a market size conversation relating to the creator market 
and I noticed that Spark was an investor in Descript. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, that, that's curious because I would have looked at Descript as, you know, podcast editing as like maybe not a big enough market for a, uh, especially like a bigger fund like Spark. And so I said, well, how did you guys get over that? Or, or was it something the founder said? And he made an interesting comment that basically all of Spark's big wins were on market size expansion. Mm -hmm. That at the time they wrote the check, the market was a lot smaller than, you know, sort of what it eventually became. And so they just don't over-index too much on market size because they've just learned historically that it, it just hasn't been as much of a factor. But he also points to um, the Figma acquisition. Mm -hmm. That something like only 20% of Figma's paid users are actually full-time user experience and design professionals. That when you make the tool collaborative and you make it easy enough for other people to use, other people decide to you know get into the process and you know obviously a ton of founders have their Figma accounts and you know they're not graphic design people by design but if they, you can save a, a few dollars here and there uh, not having to outsource everything to a designer uh, or being able to comment uh, that made their market you know five times bigger than what would it have been if they were just going through the, the graphic design professionals. I had a couple other really tactical sure. points that I wanted to share. So a couple other great tools for proving market size, especially if you're in a market that you think the VC doesn't intuitively understand, like they'd say women's health or, you know, so like is find comps, right? What are the publicly traded companies in your space? What are their valuations? What are the multiples on revenue that they're trading at? Those are things VCs are gonna look at. Give them to them up front if you've got good numbers there. And the other one is if you're early to a category, but there are some other funded players by reputable VCs out there, that can be a stamp of approval to say, hey, some other people are investing in this space. Something's happening over here. Non-competitive ideas. Non-competitive ideas, right. But, but, but that can get people to get you past the sniff test of, eh, market's too small. If you can give some good comps, some big comps, and or if you can kind of show, hey, there's movement in this space, that's enough to pay attention and get them to dig in a little bit more. For sure. So, okay, so you decided to raise for this. How did you decide how much? Did you give yourself a, a certain timeline or goals? Like, how did you get to the number? And yeah, let's just start there on number. Yeah, and I want to make one comment on the market piece because I think this is, like, as a founder, I realize over time that on a smaller scale, our job is to make a big bet, right? Like we're betting our time and energy and all of, like, if, like, if you do get investment, you're like, this is your shot to do something. Um, and so for the market piece, when you mentioned Figma, I think that like, as I was leading up to the fundraise, I was doing the research on like, what does the process look like? Um, but also doing research on like, where companies failed in this space and go find their stories anywhere. Um, and like, what we're building is really in the like, knowledge worker space, right? Uh, eventually, when we're talking about market, it's really hard in a sense because it's like literally everyone needs this. Uh, so, um, and it's, it's, it's hard because people are like, then you're not too narrow, you need to narrow it up. But Figma was actually a really great like tear down I did of what did they do? What was their, like, like Figma Grammarly. So if you're building in a space, look at companies that are not what you're building necessarily, but maybe had that huge market at the end. Because Figma was like this great B to C to B read the documents on it, but, um, okay, so I, you know, really do believe that I'm making this bet, like, I can predict what's happening in this next few months of my area, so I'm an expert in machine learning and AI, I have again and again been able to make a bet what's happening in 18 months, and I look back and I'm like, yes, I was right, so I have the confidence in that, um, so for this, I'm making a bet that, you know, what is the world, like, what is, what are the things that are changing, how can I tell the story, so I have the process then, Coming up with a list of investors is like the obvious thing to do. Um, so I came up with a list of like 100 something VCs. I had no idea about anyone in VC. I think I met you through Hillary maybe, right. but really no idea. I'd never interacted with You showed with up at an event. Right? I went to a cheese, or the, the um, Shake, Shake Shack event, yeah, right before the pandemic, yeah. So it was right around the time I was like, I think I'm gonna quit and start a company. I had someone I knew who was a founder that I worked with and she was like, go to this event. I think this is a great idea, I think you should do it. So she was helpful. Um, but where did you get the VC list? I this is the thing I had to come up with it. So I went and found people. I was in on deck, so I went and looked through all of the conversations to see who people mentioned. Then I would open up the website, I would read it, put it in Airtable, say like, okay, what kind of like space are they operating in? Does this align at all with what we're doing? 
I ranked all of them. And then I went on Twitter and found people commenting on each other's companies. So any kind of raise announcement, I would look at the list of that. Then I went to Crunchbase and looked at companies that were like not directly competitive, but could be, and I reverse engineered their investor list from that. This took a long time. Um, better choice, find another founder in your space that's building, you know, maybe not the same competitive thing, but say, can I get your investor list as a starting point? And I've definitely given this list to other founders and said, you know, awesome. absolutely, yeah. That's awesome. uh, so I think I had like, like 100 something investors in this area and I ranked them all and I put the areas they were in. And then your job is to say, okay, do I know any of them? Do I have a connection to any of them? Can I get a connection to any of them? Um, and so setting up the process is saying, I'm gonna commit to like full, full time, uh, like to say eight weeks, I think is what I did for the first one. Um, eight weeks I'm gonna be having these conversations. Uh, do as much prep as you can before you even start scheduling those, like have a deck ready. I spent way too long on a deck because I had to keep changing it throughout. Um, but have a deck, have a story. I did not do a memo. I tried and I was like, I don't know what the what use this is gonna be. Um, but then, you know, at that point, then it's reaching out to people, trying to get an introduction, have your blurb ready, have everything ready to go so you're not thinking about that stuff. But then, um, so I was able to set up the meetings. I was surprised that it was not the hardest thing to get intros and people saying yes. Like, I think from my perspective, I was like- People saying yes to a meeting. Yeah. Like, I don't think I got an, I don't really, I got like maybe a couple of no's, but they were basically like, I invest in their direct competitor now. I'm like, I, so the other thing was on the list, I had a list of investors that I knew had invested in competitors and they were a no-go. So if someone's like, hey, I'd love to introduce you to so-and-so, I was able to easily say no. Like they invested in, you know, whatever, Rome at the time. Um, so I had a plan with that. Uh, it felt, really hard once I'd started though, and what I wish I'd done differently was, um, I had done practice pitching with other founders, which I highly recommend, and I'd ask them to like, poke holes in the story, ask questions, see what, what I should change. Every, like, at least 10 people got my deck and like, gave me feedback. Second time founders are awesome for that, like they gave really actually good feedback. Um, but when I started, it still felt like the story that I was telling could change a bunch, and that worried me. Like in the conversation, if they were interested in something, I was like, oh no, like should I go off of this like thing that I planned? Um, and I actually think in those conversations, it was useful to have spent the time to think really hard about the story and know if the investor wanted to go off the path, sort of like I could very easily go off the path and we could talk about it, but then like be able to strategically bring them back onto the path. And so I think I failed in that a few times. Like people got interested in the technical details, and then we would go off in that direction, and at the end of the call, I feel like they didn't understand the business part of it, right? Like, or they were like, "Boy, well, yeah, you seem really great technically, but you're not a business person." Um, so in those initial calls, they're short, and they're making a choice on you. I mean, me at the time I was just a founder at a deck. You were my, I think my first, yeah, you were my first yes. Um, and I remember in the call, I think I said, "Really?" <laughs> <laughs> and you were like. Away. Yes. <laughs> Isn't that what you're here for? <laughs> but I think I was so like ready to, go, and I was like, but I, I, I haven't finished the whole deck. Like, the deck. We haven't finished the deck yet. And you were like, here's why I'm saying yes. Like, you're like a good bet. This makes sense. But like, you like all these things make sense to me. Um, so that was helpful. Um, the funny I, thing about that is, I run into this issue where I completely roll over the deck, like two slides in, I don't think I've ever let, if, if you finish the deck when you're pitching me, like it's probably a no, because I'm just not engaged at all. But then what sometimes happens is I'm like, yes, and then I'll introduce you to other people or to some of my limited partners, and this has happened a couple of times, it was sort of embarrassing. Sometimes the deck's not good, or the presentation of the deck is not good, but I riffed on the idea and so, like, I've put people in front of my limited partners, some of whom are angel investors and might want to co-invest, and I'm like, oh my god, this business is terrible. But it's not, like, I got psyched about the idea and we riffed on it and I never let this founder go through the deck, and now that I'm listening to the deck, this is painful, because my LPs tend to, like, not interact, so they're just, it's like crickets and you're doing your thing, and so, um, while, most of the time, I think, to your point, it's like, the deck will change and the story will change, lots of people will have feedback. A lot of times, 
you, they won't even let you go through the deck. And somebody who I, I think is like really excited, probably, I, I almost think that the more excited somebody is, the less you're gonna have to rely on the deck because they kind of already know half of the stuff that's in there or they can get it. Yeah. Um, so you, 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 you just said it actually. Yeah, it's, it's just a conversation. It's just a conversation. That's all it is. Like, once someone is really bought in on what you're saying and the pitch and they get it, like, you're not really going, you're not pitching. Like, it should feel like a normal conversation like this. You should, you should, feel, you should feel stressed because, you know, you are saying and you're being critical about everything and you need to know your numbers. You need to know, like, what, you're, what you want to get at and your points to, to get your point across. The key of the first meeting is to get the second meeting, right? And I think that sometimes um, that just happens naturally if it's a good conversation. And you can tell when somebody's bought in. I want to drill on something that you said, um, and I'll, I'll catch you in a second. Um, you talked about sort of reading the headlines of like who gets funded, and you know, uh, feeling or, or at least reading that other people have felt like this is not a thing that's built for me. And so now you go out and you decide you're going to make a list and, and pitch. How much did that? play into your calculation of either like, do I need to pitch more people or do I need to look for signals? This is gonna be somebody who who wants to take a conversation with me. And then like, did those headlines play out in any way in your experience of pitching? Yeah, I think for me, um, it, it really don't, I mean, the beginning of the whole fundraising process because I always look back in retrospect and I say that I waited too long. Right? And I think a lot of that was just imposter syndrome, like, oh, I'm not good enough, or I don't think that I'm, I'm ready for fundraising, um, no one's going to take a meeting with me because, you know, I just, I'm just not making enough money. And um, maybe that stemmed from I also the fact that I read a, I oh, oh, sorry, um, I was saying that uh, for, for me, it was a lot of it in the beginning of the process because I felt as if, like, I just wasn't, I wasn't ready for, for fundraising or that my metrics weren't enough. And, the things that I was doing like wouldn't be as appealing, and I was wrong, right? Because when I started to fundraise, our MRR for the for our, our pre seed round was about like eight thousand dollars a month in, in MRR, and I quickly realized like post fundraising, like, oh like the or mid through was like oh like the, like the standard is like two to three thousand, like that's impressive. or sometimes zero or sometimes zero, right? And so um, there's all these things that were just coming into my head. It's just like oh like wait, just like get two more customers and two more clients, and just like you're just punching out like this glass ceiling and waiting for this God signal to say, okay, like you're, you're ready or some outside validation that um, that it's like your time. Um, and so it, it wasn't until I started fundraising, and I was like, okay, well, I am getting meetings, like this is great. But then I felt like a lot of times I'd get on these VC meetings and stuff like this, and I think a lot of people can relate. Um, and I would get that, hey, we love you as a founder. Like, you're phenomenal, you are amazing. Your product is like, I've never seen a pre-seed with a product like this that's so built out. Like, how did you even do it? And it's like, well, because I have a product manager background and I speak the language and I can get into the technicals. Um, but it was that, it, it, a lot of times it was just that. It was like, oh, we love you. We are really sorry that we can't do this. Your product is great, but I felt like the market size conversation was like, just like a kind of a cop out um, as to like why, like we couldn't get that first yes or something like that. Um, and this could, could have been wrong, but I just felt like that I kept getting the same conversation. It was just like, you're amazing, we love you, we love the product, but it was always like a but, right? Um, and so we had Collab Capital to really delve into the details, like same conversation, but it, instead of it being, oh, like we like we love you, it was like, no, we love you and we're going to give you some money, you know? Um, and so Collab exclusively invests in a lot of um, black and um, Latino ex uh, funded founders and they have their own thesis there. Um, to other to look at the first check fund. Um, and so when I look back, I, it's, it's hard for me to say like what was, like what stopped a lot of the others. Um, it was interesting that once we got the first check, like it did open up a lot more. So it could have been that dynamic. It could also have been like, hey, you still need that first yes before someone else wants to come in. Like, you know, it refers them to the party, right? Especially the VC space. Um, and so seeing those headlines, it was, it, it was just a lot of like that imposter at the beginning, just thinking that this wasn't the right time. No. I'm not, I'm not ready for it, but I was actually wrong. Um, Kate, you had a comment? Well, first of all, both Charlie and I like to be first to the party, yeah. both personally and professionally. Yeah. So <laughs> that's just who we are. <laughs> I love that. You're but, invited. Um, but I wanted to make a distinction around what it's like to pitch an individual and what it's like to pitch a team. Because they're different, right? So Charlie's a solo GP. I work on a team of four GPs. 
right? And so you're going to come into the firm and you're going to talk to one person. And then if things are going well, you're going to be going through a process. And pitching that first person and getting your advocate is very different than going and pitching the whole partnership. And so what I would say is in that situation, talk to your advocate, right? Because if someone's bringing you through the process, they're doing it because they think there's something there, right? And there's gonna be a detractor, and there's gonna be, like there's gonna be, in our case, it's not really politics, it's just people have different opinions, right? And they have different skills and different backgrounds, and so they see problems from different angles. That's why we're a partnership, right? We want those, those voices around the table so we can make the best decision. But I think that having a tight deck when you're pitching a team is really important because if you can, in a crisp way, get through the holistic story of who you are, why you're the only people in the world that can build this thing, what it is, how big it's gonna get, how you're gonna make money. Like if you can get through that whole thing, then you set a foundation for really good questions. Um, and if you let a team of four derail you too much before you've gotten through that, it can get really messy because it's very hard, especially on Zoom, to manage what's happening with each of those people. And it's still a conversation, yeah. right? So I do think, especially if you're talking to a, you know, a team of professional investors, so not angel investors, that are investing as a team, you're getting through the process, the strategy changes a little bit, the yeah. dynamics change a little bit, but your advocate can be, or you know, whoever that kind of deal lead, they can be your best friend in that process because they'll help you figure out you know, what's the key question we have to get over, maybe it's market size, and hopefully you can work together to maybe build a new slide or come up with some data together that really presents what the Achilles heel might be proactively to the team. And that team dynamic, so I experienced that. I worked at First Round Capital for two years. And at the time, I was a principal level non-partner, so I could lead deals, but I couldn't vote on them, mm. which was a really fascinating dynamic. So I had to get three out of four partners to say yes to my deals. So um, up until that pitch meeting, 99% uh, of your interaction was with me. And I was sort of managing the, you know, uh, Monday morning partner meeting, I would share that I'm interested in a particular deal, uh, I'd get some feedback, I'd go back to the founder and say, hey, you know, somebody asked about how you're different than this company, or somebody asked about, you know, this market size question, what can you give me? Like, you know, because, I trust your instincts about this, so I, I may not have asked the market size question because I just like intuitively believe it, but like let's come up with a good answer for somebody who doesn't intuitively right. believe it. And, uh, but you know, um, the, the thing that is different from every firm is like, so I did lead like eight or nine deals in the two years that I was there, but there are some other folks who may not be partners at their firms who um, can't necessarily lead a deal and they are psyched and they're just as psyched about your company as they are to do any deal whatsoever because they are a junior person trying to build their track record and they're just really hoping that they get this one and, and I've seen companies where they they have that enthusiastic junior person who's trying to get them over the hump and they just get clobbered in the partner meeting and it turns out that this junior person like has no Full, misread the room was like had a different tolerance for failure um, for example like I worked with another principal there at the time and like I went into the meeting with the folks most more more than like it was the founders to lose because I wouldn't send something to the meeting unless I thought it was it was done and I got nine out of twelve deals that I sent to the meeting done and the ones that didn't at least got to two votes but um, the other principles there was more like, hey, you know what, our partnership is kind of unpredictable. I'm gonna go volume, right? And so he had something to bring to the partnership all the time, had a much lower hit rate, uh, which would have driven me nuts, because I would have hated right. to get turned down like at the one yard line, basically. But you know, you, you understanding the dynamic of uh, not only the firm, but also um, the dynamics of the, the fund cycle, too. It's like, I was just actually meeting with a, a company this morning that's raising, and you know, sometimes VC firms are at the end of a fund, and they've got like two deals left, and so the bar becomes really high. Or 
they're just at the beginning, and they're just like, hey, well, we don't want to rush to put all this money out just yet, or, or maybe they're feeling flush with money. Yeah. And so understanding where VC firm is in that dynamic is, is super helpful to you. Um, so I just want to talk about actually like getting to that first yes. So you mentioned that it was collab yeah. was the first yes that you got. Um, could you just give us the, some of the high level stats on like how long between like the first time you emailed somebody and that yes, and then um, how long the, um, did you spend with them in particular? Like how many meetings? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so before the yes, I think I got about 15 or 15, 16 no's. So that was 15, 16 no's and then the one yes. Um, and so we had that first, actually what was, what was interesting is that um, for some VCs, like you can actually apply online and, you, and they have like simple forms, like not every VC does the whole like, you can only contact me through a warm introduction. And so like that already just acts on a large majority of like people who may not have like someone on LinkedIn or someone on like Signal who can just make an well, intro. guessing my email address. Yeah, like, like, we're going on like 100 IO and like, you know, trying to figure that out, um, which I feel like VCs don't like that much, like random cold emails. Um, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, once we actually applied on their website, um, which was a simple form, and actually it was too busy running my other business, so I was like full time fundraising, but I still had another business that was bankrolling like our like my livelihood, which is something that a lot of founders don't really talk about. Which you should is like, well, how do you even survive while you're fundraising? That's a whole other conversation. Um, and so we, we ended up filling out the form, and I think I heard back a week later from Sydney, who was a who was a investment associate. Um, and I got an email from her, hey, like we reviewed your, your uh, 30 question form with your pit tech. We think this is something that um, we're interested in. I'm gonna schedule a meeting if you're interested with uh, Jewel. So I was like, okay, great. Um, and so from that first email, I jumped on a meeting with Jewel first about like a week later or so. And she was like in the car, like when I was like, oh, this is interesting. She's like driving her, the in the car, driving. driving. Uh, but she was like attentive and she knew what was going on and I was just like, I was ready, like suited up, like ready to go, like having this whole conversation. And she's like, yeah, like don't worry, just have a conversation. And then I kind of realized, oh, this is, okay, that's this is a regular conversation, right? So um, that first meeting took like a week. Uh, I had a great conversation with Jewel. She just wanted to know what was going on, give a high level deeds, like where our revenue was at, like what was I thinking, what was I building, like, like what like, what was next? And I think that um, a lot of times, what I like to say is that, you know, you should bring high energy to these calls, right? Like when you get on these VC calls, you're talking to people, like bring the energy, like smile, even if you're not even like looking at the person, smile when you're speaking because like energy is reciprocal and like, people can feel that, right? And you're excited and things like that. Um, so that first meeting was great, um, spoke about 30 minutes and she was bought in enough off of just this phone call that she said, okay, great, we'll schedule another meeting with the three other, uh, with, the, with the two other GPs, so three of them, Jewel, Barry, um, and Justin. And so then a week and a half later, it's about two and a half weeks in, um, we get on this Zoom call and uh, I'm looking at everybody, I'm like super scared, I'm like, oh my God. Um, and it was again, just another conversation, but a deeper dive, but I realized that like, Jules bought in, but now I need to get Barry and Justin bought in. And so just how I was approaching the conversation, and I did a lot of research beforehand, I realized that Justin was like the software guy, so if I was gonna you know, talk technical, talk to Justin about that, and uh, Barry was someone who, you know, sold his company, so he's might be maybe more like the business focus, business model guy. Um, so I kind of read the room, and, and um, it was about an hour call. We got into the software a little bit, um, and I feel like that call went really good. And then it was okay. We'll, we'll kind of look at this, and from that moment, I realized that Justin, out of the three GPs, was the one that was really interested. And so he followed up with me, um, and then I just kept pouring him updates. We jumped on one additional call about a week and a half after, so it was about a month and a half in. Went through the whole platform with him, and he was like, oh my god, this is insane. Um, this is about a month and a half, and then I'd say two weeks later, we got, uh, I lied, I'd say about a month and a half later, because it took a lot of emailing back and forth, playing the, like, the update Scheduling, game and feeding, yeah. and feeding updates, and then we got the first yes. So full process, three months from initial reach out. Um, but I really appreciate you know the firms that don't just you know say hey like you, there's just no contact like hey fill this out but i also realize that running a firm is a business right so not every firm has like an associate who can scrape through 100 applications and you know and all that stuff so i i, I, I kind of get it um but that was how that worked and so from that first yes um i thought my job was done i was like i got this first <laughs> yes you know this, this two million raise is going to be easy it's going to be walking the park we got like you know nine hundred thousand committed and then I quickly realized that, no, like, 
you're not almost done. Like that's just one. If you want to close a two million dollar round, and their their uh, their um, their commitment originally was like seven hundred fifty thousand, they closed a million. Um, it was really hard. Like I got crushed after that. I was on this high. You get your first lead, and you're like yes, I got this. Um, and then the three other VCs that I had like as like oh super potentials that I thought just hey got a lead now this is gonna be over. They were like no. <laughs> No, no, and I was like, oh my God, what, what do I do now? And so um, it took a while and I had to reset a little bit uh, because the, the, the whole thing was that just because you have a lead that does not mean that your round is done. And they intro to others and stuff like that and that didn't work out, but it was it was, it was was a ride, you know? Um, and then it took another four months to get that next yes, which was intentional for, for a million to come in and then close everything out. And the bolster came in for um, hundred and so it was it, it, it took a while um, but uh, it was it was a journey just to um, ask about the, me the mechanics of that round so you have a commitment but it's not necessarily a check did you um, wait until the whole round was done before all the money came in did you agree to like or some minimum commitment that we could agree to before it comes in, or was it four more months until you actually got oh, dollar it was one? Four more months okay. until I got any money, and so that's why I said I was crushed because I was like, oh, you get this commitment, they're going to send the money. Be they're ready. Like, two, they're going to wire the money in two, in two weeks, and it was like, no, you need to close your round for you to get our money, and that was a hard pill to swallow because that just meant that I had a lot more work to do, uh, a lot more meetings to have, and. You know, it's very discouraging, and I feel like I went through like this depression for about two weeks in the middle of all this. Like, well, how am I going to get someone else giving me money? Like, it was so hard to even just get this. How am I going to get another, you know, big yes? And so, um, yeah, it was uh, it was really tough. Um, and so we didn't get everything. So we ended up closing all at once, got the full thing wired. Uh, but that was after getting, you know, uh, collab, a tenso, bolster, and then uh, business hands all all bought in, and so the money came at the same time. So it took like literally eight months to get everything finalized. Can you comment a little bit about how uh, just the current environment and your timing and process on deals now versus maybe where they were, you know, a year ago? I know you guys just closed, but mm -hmm. I think you were probably writing checks. We're still throughout. working, yeah. So honestly, our process has not changed that much. And, and I should say, we're a new firm, but we've actually been investing together. I've been invested with my partner, Axel, for nine years. <laughs> so we really know, like we really know each other, and we've kind of settled into a, a, a deal pace that we can't seem to either speed up or slow down. It's just how we work. <laughs> so we kind of have the way that we work. But uh, that's us, it's not the market, right? And I would say, it, two years ago, I mean, it was just, I think it was irresponsible investing. Uh, you know, you would get a pitch, and this was difficult for me because a big part for me about this work is building real relationships with people, building things that I feel like matter. Like I'm, when I take, I mean, I take a board seat in most of my investments too. So like, this is a long-term relationship. <laughs> like, and so it's, I, I actually want the person to know me and to want me to be on their team. Right, and, and vice versa. Um, and the business got very transactional in a way that I found uncomfortable and irresponsible. And I don't blame the founders who were looking at the market and basically saying, here's my deck, I need a decision by Wednesday. But that's what was happening, right? And term sheets were flying at crazy prices to the point where I was like, I don't know how any of this fund economics makes sense. Like, this is not good for anyone because there's gonna be a long tail fallout when all of a sudden, these deals don't return the $10 billion outcomes that are required to make that fund math work. And so you can just see the, the waterfall kind of chaos. Um, I think that I personally believe that the market conditions that we're in right now are a much more responsible way to build businesses and to invest. So I think that valuations have come down. I think that people are being um, less frenzied with competitive term sheets. And because of that, I am seeing the business feel less transactional. Um, now that doesn't mean that we don't need to run a diligent, swift, responsible process. We do, um, that is important. It's about our time, it's about the entrepreneur's time. Um, that, that's very important. 
but I, I, I do, I, I actually, I think it's better for everyone that the like crazy, crazy froth has ended. If only because I'm hearing some really tough stories from entrepreneurs who raised in that environment where they haven't seen hide nor hair of their investor who they would really like some intros from and they can't even get them on the phone, right? And so, and so I, I think that um, while it might seem like, huh, money just got more expensive, it did. Right, prices came down, cap cost of capital went up. Right, that's true. In some ways, that's more investor friendly. Um, but I think ultimately, if if your goal is to build a really big, enduring, impactful business over the long run, having a clean cap table of people that feel incentivized to your success is ultimately going to serve you. And if that means you take a couple more points of dilution in your first round of funding, I actually do think that's worth it. If the goal is this big long term outcome kind of how I think of the market right now. One other uh, comment I'll make about that is, you know, VC bandwidth for new deals has changed. When every single one of your portfolio companies was seemingly like doing pretty well or getting term sheets or whatever, you check in on the board call and, you know, board call's short and there's not a lot of tough discussions and then you don't have a lot of work to do after that, right? But when you know, you have to re-go through the model because you have to make what was supposed to be six months of cash last for 12 months, or you need to figure out like, you know, who is the half of the team you're gonna keep because you need to cut. That just like literally takes up more time as an investor, and so more time that I'm spending with my current portfolio companies is just less time that I have dedicated to my new deal process, right? And so it's, it's, you know, oftentimes an entrepreneur will, will feel like, oh, this is definitely a signal. It's taking them two weeks to get back to me every time, you know, we do a turn. It's maybe just that, like, I have a bunch of portfolio companies who just need their time and attention. And they only have a limited amount of time. I did want to make one point about your experience, and this was really important when starting Valkoonst to me. So I've always, I've been leading pre-seeds for about 10 years, but in the beginning they were relatively small checks. So we'd get there first, but I could only put in maybe 150K or 200K, right? And so there was this huge gap of what the founders had to raise. And oftentimes they'd only get halfway there and they'd start building and then they'd need to raise some more. And essentially what I was seeing was an 18 month, just absolute, energy evisceration of trying to operate and build and fundraise. And so one of the commitments that I made was, I want to have a fund model where I can take the whole round. That doesn't mean that I have to take the whole round, right? Like I don't need to be the only investor. Like we're happy to make space for other, you know, reputable funds that we like or you know, angel investors that are material to the business. But to me, especially for women and people of color who like I again and again have seen struggle to get that pre-product market fit money. It was really important to me to not put founders in that position if I could. And luckily we were able to raise a fund that allows for that. And so we try to look at the plan. So how much are you raising? Sometimes people say I'm raising three million and I say show me the plan. It's like you don't need three million. Why are you raising three million? You really need 1.5. So sometimes we're cutting the round size down because we want to fund the actual business plan <laughs> to the actual metrics, <laughs> right? But but my goal is to be able to say, hey, I'll speak for the whole thing. Who else do you really want, right? Who's, who do you really want around the table? And and maybe we have some intros, they have some people, and we can kind of get, get it to work out. But that for me, that was a big piece of what I wanted to change about um, how we operate at Precinct. So before we get into the audience questions, and I want to be conscious of time, um, Alice, can you comment a little bit about, um, you know, post that initial yes, sort of, if you sort of divide up the yeses and the noes, was there any kind of like pattern about how you pitched or what you did to get people over on the yeses that was sort of like made you, because you've also raised a little bit more money yeah, after that, that um, a lesson from the first go around that you went into with, with this. That was there any consistent pattern of the yeses or the who said yes that you found useful the second time around? Or maybe I, there wasn't. <laughs> I really, truly wish there was a I, I love patterns. I love finding them. I love like you know then following that pattern. Um, 
I think that, I mean, I learned a lot from, so I raised two, I raised like a smaller angel round and then a pre seed round, uh, and I think from the, I learned a lot doing it the first time, I think that was really important for me to just understand what this was um, and go through it. The second time, I feel like uh, the things that I carried over um, were like, Lessons around storytelling, keeping this on track, making sure we get to the whole picture, they understand everything before they make their decision, um, which I think was good. The, I'll say the second time I raised, though, was uh, we were preempted, uh, which was great and exciting, but it was right before everything fell apart last year. So really, like, I was having and hawing, like, should we do this? Should we wait? Should we get some more traction and go for a bigger round? What should we do? And by the time I really made the choice of like, yeah, let's go for this size pre-seed. And then, you know, the the lead at the time was like, I think this will be pretty easy to close out the rest of it. I'm putting half, there we go. And he's like, you know, let's, you know, you, maybe you make a deck, maybe you don't. And I was like, great. Um, and this was like end of April, early May 20, last year. Uh, and so this, really the second I went out there, it was a bloodbath, it was like, People were still taking calls, but they weren't going to fund anything, too. So, like, I don't think I could apply or really learn from the nose very well. The ones I could learn from were the ones where I got multiple meetings. Because, like, a no on the first one is like, okay, fine. For lots of reasons, that could be true. I tried to get feedback from everybody. Um, and I think the, you know, obviously the no is getting the feedback from them. Um, that I think, you know, going to your point was really hard for me to navigate because we're in this like economic readjustment downturn period. But, you know, for me as a founder, a lot of my no's were like, yeah, I'm not sure of the market, but I would love to get on the product the second you'll let me on. Please, please, please. I've got five people I would really like to get on the product as well. And I'm like, well, you're the market then. What are we talking about? If it's like, this doesn't even make yeah. sense right now. I feel that. Um, if you're like, yeah, yeah, but I still would really love to get on your product, and I'm like, no. Uh, but also, um, like, so the feedback I was getting, I was trying to use to change the pitch. Um, and I'll never know because I can't live another version of myself as somebody in somebody else's body. Like, how much of that, like, pushback on the business model or the market was really, is there a business model market here, or is it that like we need to say no, but we're not sure how, and you're technically, obviously, very qualified. Uh, so this is the thing that we can kind of lean on. Um, so I did try to shift things. I did try to like talk about the market differently, talked about the business plan differently. Um, I don't think any of the patterns helped me get to the yes. I think the yeses, like they believed in me, they believed in the vision. They, you know, at this stage of company, they were like, yes, we believe there is a market for this. We don't care necessarily if today you're like, I know the exact you know, this is exactly who the market was going to be for. Like, they understood that there was going to be this journey we were going on together, and they wanted to do that. So, I wish I, I wish there was a pattern. I wish there was like a like a clear, you know, path there. Um, and the ones that are hardest are when you get to that, th like the, you know, you're like three or four meetings in, and there are no. Yep. And you're like, oh my god, I just like this has taken months. We went through all of this. Like, how are we a no right now? Like, how did I screw up at the very end of this line? They're the hardest support. for us too, for the record. Yeah. They are. They're yeah. the hardest for us too. Yeah. Yeah. Although I would I would say that there are some or for me. firms. They're the hardest for me. Yeah. They're for sure. <laughs> I struggle with those. Uh, that there are some firms that probably don't allocate their time wisely. Mm -hmm. Right? That like if you're four meetings in and no, like something went wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Or or you just I, I think like sometimes you find a founder really compelling, but in hindsight you were never going to get there on this particular market or this particular product. And that's, that's where you have to check yourself, just be like, would I back this founder to do just about anything else? Mm -hmm. and, and that that's is good. sometimes where it's like, I us. love riffing with this person. I can imagine what it would be like working with them, but like, I really hate this market. Um, the, the one thing I'll say too that I've seen change, so I've been in venture now um, over 20 years. I started off on the LP side. There was actually a date in August of last year in which I was in this asset class for half of my life, which was really scary. Um, but because of the interconnectedness of venture now, that I like I've, is more so than I've ever seen before. Um, what people say about markets infects firms in a way that uh, I've just never seen before. Right? So like. This is a terrible market, despite the fact that like all my companies might be doing well, or you know that uh, 
you know, none of my companies have this valuation issue or all this sort of stuff. You just, you, you hear it through Twitter or other water coolers, and so it just effectively becomes true. And I think that's particularly true with sectors. I've never seen such a divergence in between um, how hot a sector can be and how cold a sector can be. It's like, would you rather be out there pitching a, you know, natural language generation like AI platform right now or e-commerce, right? Like that gap uh, has never been so big. Like there'll always be sectors where it's like, oh, e-commerce is tough versus like, no, we'll never do a consumer-based e-com, like just zero. It's like, I don't care how much money you're making, I don't care plan or all of that sort of stuff. There are certain sectors that are just completely out of favor for VC and other ones where you know, you saw with the Web3 or blockchain where, where it's just like, no, give me any of that. And, and you can sort of morph and like, oh, we have a small element of that. Oh, that's good enough because I can't get into all the other ones, right? And, and I, I think that's a really tough dynamic for certain founders because I think that, you know, your headline sector drives a lot of whether or not somebody is going to be interested in something. So I think, like, how you describe your sector we're also, also just acknowledging, I mean, one of my prior portfolio companies, it was a really great company um, in the travel space and had its best month in February of 2020, which was really unfortunate, it didn't make it through. Uh, because we didn't expect that people wouldn't be traveling for like more than a year. Uh, there were some people who just like didn't like the travel space from a VC perspective. And so when we pitched that deal, I, I literally made the intro to them and in the intro was, the travel space sucks for VC investment, except for this company, and here's why. And like, I was op I was tracking the opens, and like, I had almost 100% open rate because the VCs were like, okay, I gotta, I gotta see this, right? And it just acknowledged all of the things of like, this is why travel sucks, right? Like this thing, this thing, and this company is an effect by these three things like here is why like when you're in transactional that you get squeezed on margins and it's pennies on pennies because it's affiliate or, or what have you and uh, and so at the end of the day if you could make it through that like there's no way you could take that meeting and say yeah but I want to do travel because we said it in up front we said all of the terrible things and you still were willing to take the meeting so like let's get that out of the way stage is one of them Right, like you said that there were VCs who said yes who were comfortable with the fact that you didn't know exactly what this thing would be right now. A bunch of pre-seed investors are more likely going to be willing to do that than the seed plus folks who are gonna to wanna to know your MRR and understand what the business model is and whatever. And it doesn't necessarily mean that like you're too early for venture, it's just that that firm doesn't start investing until that point. Um, yeah, just on okay. that point, uh, that's a huge waste of time. I I cannot tell you how many meetings I've taken because someone's super interested in a meeting, but they're saying I invest in X stage, which is not my stage, and they're like, but sometimes we invest in like the oh. earlier stages, and you're like, so there's a chance. That, that but sometimes. <laughs> but then you go through their process, and it's like they want to see the metrics for the stage they're comfortable with. They don't want to see like, and so they're like. Oh, we can only get there if you had like these things, and I'm like, yeah. If I was at a later stage, I, I would totally expect that, but we're not, and that was super clear in the beginning. Um, but they kept having meetings. Oh my god, we have five meetings, and I'm like, oh my god, I, this is a huge waste of time for me, and like, a, you know, emotionally, time wise, like energy. Um, can I offer a tip on that? Yeah. Because that's something that I've seen a lot, and so my tip is, I would love to go deep with you when I'm done with this round. Right. Right, because that if that person is that excited, then they might be your seed or your Series A investor, and that's a great time to build that relationship. But just be clear, like I'm ex really excited to meet you when I'm done with this round, and yeah. like, and I think that is a kind, yeah. like I you know a kind way of, of managing your time. But I can understand how you can get in the meeting and you're not sure, right? You don't you don't really know, and, and so I, I totally I just did that with that. a portfolio company of mine where. They were. In, I told them. I said, "Hey, if anybody is really interested and they want to hear from the lead investor why they went into this company, I'm happy to hop on the phone." Totally. And so uh, we have a round in progress, and they introduced me to this fund. And the fund was like, "Yeah, it would be great to catch up with you 
and chat in the next few weeks. And I was like, next few weeks? No, 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 this, this round's happening now. And so I, I literally just qualified the meeting. And I said, hey, just to be clear, are you at the end of your process and just trying to double check why the lead is doing this round and learn a little bit about the person that you're gonna be in this deal with? Or are you essentially a pass on this company and you're just shooting the shit with me because you want to get to know another VC, which is totally cool, mm -hmm. but I actually need to prioritize my time for people who are going to do this deal right now. And they're like, oh, no, 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 we told them this is earlier than we normally go. And I was like, well, they might not interpret that as a pass. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is earlier than we normally do. It is, it's sort of like, you know, being up in the airplane and the airplane doors open, you have your parachute on and you saying like, I've never done this kind of thing before. <laughs> and like, but you have your parachute on, you're gonna jump with me, right? I was like, no, I told you I've never done this kind of thing before. <laughs> and it's like, oh, oh, I didn't realize I was the only one jumping. Why didn't you tell me I'm not going to jump right now, I'm not comfortable. Uh, but that's sort of VC speak. For anything else that isn't like we'd like to invest this much in this round at this price, is kind of basically a pass. Uh, and if you're not sure, you could definitely ask them. And so that's exactly what I said to that fund. I'd love to get to know you. Sounds like you're a great potential partner. I'm prioritizing the calls, and I just ducked the call because I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be with them this week. Totally, and I'd say that's especially prevalent amongst maybe junior people in firms who are tasked with covering a certain sector, right? It's their job to get a jump on the next hot ML thing. Like, and they don't want to miss, if all of a sudden your round escalates to being $10 million in Andreessen's in and Sequoia's in, like it's their job to make sure that they saw it and that they got a chance to be sit have seat at the table, right? And we've both been junior people at front, so we can rag on the junior people. Yeah, we can, like, yeah, like, like with love, right? There. Like they're trying to do, they're, they're trying to do their job to like deliver on meeting all the best people in the sector, right? And so like that's, that's their frame of reference. And so I do think it's like boundaries work, <laughs> right? Of like, what's my boundary? Of like, how willing am I to give my time to this person who's like a 10% chance? Mm -hmm. And that might depend on how big your pipeline is, mm -hmm. right? Um, or if you went to the same college and both played basketball with the same coach. You know, I don't know. There's sometimes there's like an X factor with that person. But I do think that's especially tricky with those like bigger firms with junior people that are just trying to cover their beat, basically. Cool. Let's get three. Uh, maybe four, depending on speed, uh, audience questions. So we'll go one, two, three, and then we'll see what time. Cool. My name is Dalton Scash. I work for American Express Ventures. I didn't catch your name. Alex. 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 And I like want to restaurant. identify a fundraising trap that I think that you avoided in that. Like I just wanted to kind of bring it up and hear more from, from the VCs as well. But you mentioned when you were fundraising that it was like Web3 season, right? It was Web3 and crypto season. and. Uh, you identified and said, hey, you know, all the money's going that way, but I'm not going to hop into that. I'm not going to get into that because that's not our business. And so I wanted to ask the, the VCs here is, you know, how important is it for a founder to stay true, authentic, and focused when raising rather than going off track? Have you ever not done a deal because you've gone 80% of the way there and it sounds great, and then the very last minute they go, and we are an AI company now, and we're an NFT company. So has that ever happened before, and how, how can founders go about that? I've seen that, actually, when I worked for First Round Capital. Um, Josh Koppelman had this very funny analogy, and he was talking to a company, and he had an image of his mind of what the product should be. And the founder was, he got the sense that the founder uh, thought that was close enough, but it wasn't ultimately what the founder wanted to, to build. And the way he described it is like, we both agreed that we've got like sugar, flour, milk, and eggs, right? But I'm talking about baking a cake and you're talking about making cookies. And we keep talking about the flour and the sugar and all that sort of stuff and there's like a high overlap, but ultimately, if you baked cookies and I was in the mood for cake, I'd be an unhappy camper. And I, I think it really is important to have that clarity because, I mean, it feels good to get the money now, but if you have people around the table who aren't on board with your plan, I mean, like, A, you're probably going to have to get more money from them later. 
and if it turns into something that like they're not into, uh, that can be problematic. But it's just also going to create a lot of like unhelpful friction on the point of the cap table. So I, I definitely have seen something, and this especially happens in the pre-product world, where you're ideating, and in, in your mind, your your you know the the product should be here, and, and that's kind of where the founder is. And I think it's important, despite my protests, because as Alice will attest, I have a lot of ideas. But at the end of the day, you have to be like, this is what I think is exciting for this reason. And then just like walk away and let the founder do their thing. Um, and, and that's really hard. And I think you, as a founder, you, you, each VC is one user data point. And you can't say that, well, that user data point counts for 10 because they're my check. Because um, that's just going to lead to some downstream problems later on. May I ask some follow up questions, Zach? Uh, sure, but quick. Um, how do you get a VC excited about a sector that they're not a season in? Like right now, it's AI. Okay, season. that's not a follow up question. That's a different question. Okay. But we'll get to you. You'll be number four if we get okay, through these other three. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Number one in my car. <laughs> um, I have a question that I'm hoping, I'm hoping to answer it. Um, and this is helpful for founders. So oftentimes there's a conversation around um, how you land your vision, right? And Brandon I spoke, spoke a little bit where it's like somewhat conversational versus like the business school approach. And you kind of spoke to, to the tech being spy on. Can you speak to the nuance in your delivery of the pitch as a founder and how you guys see it in a different way that's nuanced where it's like you come up to the business school full presentation mode, I've done this before versus like I know the problem, I come in, back to the envelope, my deck is in the car, you know, I'm that confident. So like can you speak to kind of um, what you guys appreciate in terms of the pitch and how it is? I think the number one thing is understanding your strength and playing to it. Because as a CEO, you have to sell. I'm not the last person you're gonna sell. You have to figure out how to hire your first 10 employees making a quarter of the money that they were making at their other job and taking 10 times the risk. You have to sell your law firm on cutting your bill. You have to sell the consultancy on giving you better payment terms, right? And different kinds of leaders sell and lead differently. And I really believe that in this industry, there is space for a lot of different kinds of leaders. If you are a engineering oriented, quant oriented person who loves details, you might be best served going in with a really tight, data-driven, highly specific rehearsed pitch. I have seen that be true for many of the leaders that have that background in my portfolio. If you are a beautiful, inspiring storyteller, and you know how to step into a room and make people feel something, lean into that and follow up with, with the details. Right, and so I think the important thing is to understand where does your comfort live, right? And to, and, to, and to follow that path, because I think that in order to be good at our jobs, we have to really understand a spectrum of quality. Um, and I think also just to take a moment for like neurodivergent people, we work with a lot of neurodivergent people. Like, I don't know if I've back, I think I've backed one, per, two people at Harvard Business School, not a lot. Right, so like I I'm personally not trying to pattern match for someone who wears khakis. That's like not the goal, right? I think there's a there's a concept of that goal, and similarly, there's a lot out there about oh, wear your turtleneck and you know be be unkempt or whatever. It's not, if that's not who you are, don't don't be that, right? Because I think authenticity is the number one thing that anyone wants in a relationship, uh, in any relationship, really. And this is a relationship, and so. I would really follow that and figure out how do you authentically tell your story. Right, like, don't get in and out of poly just because of what's going on in right. FTX. Like, it's not. <laughs> it's like, it's be, be who you are. Be who you are. <laughs> so, uh, the other thing I'll say is, um, I think 
I, I think that's true, but I think you have to be knowledgeable enough to be dangerous is the sort of bar for other styles of pitching and, and communication as well, right? And I'll, I'll think back to, uh, I was one of the first VCs to see um, Crystal Mobignani's pitch for Bento Box. And Crystal uh, just sold the company last year, had a phenomenal exit. Uh, every time I heard about her fundraising and, and the exit was a little like, ah, I really wish I would have said yes. And that, um, and, and I always used to joke around with her. I'm like, you're really making me regret that, that, that first no. And I even came and spoke at that company and we talked about that first pitch. But in her first pitch, she came from a designer background mm -hmm. and she had somebody else build the financial model. And so I, um, having previously, when I was a first round capital backed single platform, that was very like sales driven and price point and salesperson of e efficacy. She was selling to that same customer. And so that's just where I came from. I was like, okay, well, you know, uh, how many people could, how many restaurants could a salesperson sell in a given week, in a given month? Like, what's the profitability, blah, 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 whatever. And because she had totally outsourced the building of that financial model, like, really couldn't very quickly get through the Excel to find the answer, change it around on the fly, because that just like wasn't her background. But she knew that her customer set wanted this product because she had been selling it to them in more of a services-based business and was building you know, SaaS around it, right? So she knew it was a thing, but when I went in with my like, you know, former finance person, Excel, I was like, oh man, like I don't, like, I can't get the answers that I'm looking for, so my default is no, so I, I have to say no. Now, it wasn't very long before she uh, added to her team and got to know the financial models better and, and, and became much more versed in them to the point where, like, had I gotten that pitch a couple months later, she probably would have nailed it, right? And, and that's maybe something where I may have spoken a little too quickly on that, on that first no. But, um, and I think it's especially the case when you're on the operator side, right? Like once you get the funding, now we have to like instrument this company and make sure we don't run out of cash and you very quickly become uh, very up to speed on how you manage those financials, even if that's not your strength. <clears throat> Like, don't think it's the kind of thing you just like outsource to the part-time CFO or, or, or on the other side. Like, if you're more of a business person, don't just be like, yeah, I just threw it over the fence to a designer and, it, you know, because then when we're looking at the conversion numbers and they're not good, like, you need to have an intuitive sense for like what your, you know, consumer is looking for. And you should jump in on some of the user tests, even though you're a finance background and, and, and get that sense. So you kind of need to do a little bit of everything, but I think while still being authentic. Um, somebody else was number three over here. There was a hand raised. Who was three? I said one, two, three. It wasn't you. Okay. Oh, we'll get to him and then, then you. So maybe that person bailed. Go ahead. Uh, my question is about how to get a VC excited about a sector that is not season in, right? So right now it's the AI season. Last, night, last year was Web3. What are you doing to get into VCs if it's a sector that I'm familiar with? Um, I have a funny answer to that. Uh, so the first time I raised, uh, I was telling the VCs that we're more interested in the details. Like, transformer models are a really big deal. I'm predicting that in a year this is going to take over. And like, the, like I explained all of it very, you know, fine. And they're like, you seem really smart. Um, I just don't know that this is going to be a thing. Like, I, and so like I got a lot of no's because people were like, yeah, we've seen like these applications of machine learning, we just really don't, we, we, we can't, we can't, we can't follow you on that path, right? Um, and so like I raised in, as an AI ML person in the Web3 season and they were like, nah, for these really funny reasons now because we're, you know, whatever, a year and a half later and it's like $59 billion in open AI and I'm like, <laughs> um, so I think like for me I've sort of been in both now like if I go to raise again it's like AI season um, we'll see what the other reasons are but like um, I think like being true to what you believe in like you have you're the one betting on this it's your vision 
that comes through. Like, <clears throat> you know, if you can explain it, like maybe I didn't explain it well enough. Like maybe I didn't paint the picture well enough. Um, and so I think like you can, as long as you, I mean, lots of people are gonna say no, but that's fine. It's like 90% of people are gonna say no to you. Um, but if you're passionate about it and you believe in it, like you'll get somebody else excited enough, I, I think. Um, and you're in a market that makes sense. Like you could be really passionate about like toothpick building and like it's not gonna work, right? Like, and then you need a good friend to tell you like, hey, you should do this as something else and don't do that. But, um, but yeah, I mean like having been definitely not in the hype and now into the hype, it's like, it's sort of comical the way people have like, clashed and they're like, oh my God, it's gonna be amazing now. And I'm like, I really said that, I don't know what, <laughs> like we didn't, one finishing comment, and then we'll let everybody go, um, and I appreciate everybody's time here, is you do need to qualify whether or not they want to be in the space at all. And, you know, so if, like, I really wasn't doing, you know, um, token-based sort of crypto deals, like, I, I would be open to doing something that was an interesting application or service, and I understood why the service needed to exist, and if you just happen to use crypto on the back end or, or blockchain on the back end, like, well, fine, like, we could debate why that's the best technical decision, but if you were just like, hey, I'm doing ICO token sale, like, I'm just not going to be there, and there's plenty of other people doing stuff uh, in those areas, so when it's, like, AI season, there's still people doing enterprise, there's still people doing lots of other stuff. Um, I think you want to make sure that the person's not a hard no on that space, versus that they just um, haven't gotten a chance to understand it. And I, I think it's important for founders to be able to explain it to somebody who doesn't have a background in that space because you're gonna have to explain it to a front end engineer who just is really good at front end engineering and doesn't know anything about that space. You're gonna have to explain it to a uh, journalist because you're trying to get PR for your company and they're not yet an expert in that space. You're gonna have to explain it um, all across the board to, to lots of folks, and if you can't figure out some way to say, hey, like, let me tell you about this space, here's this thing that's happening, and why, and here's the solution, and to make it understandable, like, I'm invested in a company called Gradformation that is doing um, uh, automation of uh, radiation plans in cancer clinics, right? I don't know anything about that space. Right? But it doesn't, it's not a hard pitch to say prior to this, when you had to get radiation, a literal physicist would have to um, hand work a plan that optimizes for, you know, not damaging healthy uh, cells and not uh, damaging internal organs, all this sort of stuff. And it would take them multiple hours, and now a computer can do it in 15 minutes. Like, you don't need to be an expert to be like, yeah, I can imagine that a computer would probably be able to do that. You know, and, and oh, by the way, we have 13 hospitals that have signed up so far. And for me to go, oh, like, well, I'm not a hospital buyer, but I don't think that's an easy sale. So if you got 13 of them already, like, that's something. That's meaningful. Like, you know how to sell and you worked at the clinic before. So, like, I'm in that deal with some other people who know much more about the space. But the founder was just really good at, like, dumbing it down for me and, and helping me understand what the, the risks are. Um, thank you. Thank you everybody for making time. I know everybody's busy. Uh, Kate, I'm so glad this worked out. Um, and so, what's the best way for somebody to reach you? Um, you can email me, uh, Kate at Baukunst.co. E A U K U N S T. Or you can Google Kate McAndrew, which is what I do to find. Yeah, or find me on Twitter. <laughs> find me on Twitter. She's which fine. I'm rarely on Twitter, but if you DM me on Twitter and say you were here, I will send you my email. And, and I'm Charlie at uh, BrooklynBridge.vc. Thanks everyone. Thanks for coming, and thanks to Primary for hosting us. Um, for those of you who don't know, Primary is a co-working space down here. It's a wellness-focused co-working space, so they've got a Peloton and a fitness room and healthy snacks and uh, Five Eyes super convenient. And now we have a Whole Foods down the street, which I'm very excited about. So thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Oh yeah, it was, it was great. Yeah, it was such a treat.